All right, so I got a, another video for you guys. Um, like for real, for real, probably have COVID, but no big deal. So I might be coughing throughout this. I apologize. I've been trying to hold off until like it went away, but uh, it's Wednesday, so we gotta do what we gotta do. Uh, what we're gonna talk about first is well, we're gonna be talking about carboxylic acids as well as um, uh, nitrile groups. And so first I want to talk about the preparation of carboxylic acids because we know quite a bit about this. So the first thing is uh, if we have a primary alcohol, we can throw some, some chromium, some sulfuric acid and water. We're going to get a carboxylic acid. Remember, if we have an aldehyde, we can use the silver oxide with ammonium hydroxide. Uh, we also know how to convert Grignard reagents using carbon dioxide and acid. We can convert those to carboxylic acids as well. Uh, our fourth reaction is if we had a benzylic proton. Remember, it, could, it doesn't matter. Just as long as there's one, we can convert that into a benzoic acid with KMnO4, or potassium permanganate. In addition to that, we also have... Um, an alkyne with ozonolysis we can uh, convert two portions or two equivalents of carboxylic acid so if those R groups are the same we're going to get two of the same carboxylic acids if they're different then we're going to get some a mixture if we have a terminal alda a uh, terminal alkyne we will get co2 as well as a carboxylic acid so let's take a look at the preparation of the nitrile group now this is straightforward. This is chapter seven or eight, um, last semester. And uh, what we're gonna use is an alkyl halide with sodium cyanide. This is just a simple SN2 reaction to give us our nitrile. And we also saw cyanohydrins in the previous chapter as well. Now yeah. let's take a look at the structure and bonding. So the structure and bonding of carboxylic acids, pretty straightforward. We already know this stuff. We've seen it before time and time again. So. Um, it can be abbreviated COOH, which is something you should know, and which we've seen again a lot. And carboxylic acids can also be called, carb like the functionality, the functional group can be called a carboxy group. And that is a combination of carbonyl as well as hydroxy. So the CO and the OH. And so we also know that that, SP that carbon and the carbonyl group is sp2 hybridized and is 120 degree angle approximately. Okay. Uh, for the nitriles, we have that C triple bond to N, and this is called a cyano group. And this is in the chapter because it's got the same oxidation state as carboxylic acids. That carbon is SP hybridized and 100, at 180 degrees. So uh, both of those are going to be susceptible to nucleophilic attack. Okay. So that's pretty much it for structure and bonding. And when it comes to nomenclature, remember I always tell you guys like do this on your own because you don't want to hear me talk about like cyclohexane, carboxylic acid, like this, it's kind of boring. But there are a few things that I want to do for you guys because I find them interesting, but I also uh, just want to give you that information. So there are some common names. So there's parent names, we have, we've seen this before, but I want to remind you guys, so we have the parent name could be form, acet, propion, buter, valer, capro, or benz. And these are going to have one, two, three, four, five, or six carbons or a benzene ring. <clears throat> now, what does this look like when it pertains to carboxylic acids? Well, this is formic acid. This is my attempt at drawing the italicized word because formica is actually a genus of ants. And what's really cool about that name is also because formic acid is actually the reason why a red ant sting or bite actually is irritating because they're putting formic acid into your body. And yeah, that sucks. It's an acid, right? We also have acetic acid, which is super common. Also comes from acetum, uh, meaning like vinegar. Uh, we have valer, uh, valeric acid acid we also have benzoic acid and so these are some super common ones that i want you guys just to be familiar with valeric acid is a common um, 
fatty acids. So if you take some fat, some fats, and you uh, put them in a basic environment, like I always refer to a Fight Club because they do saponification and make some soap. Um, valeric acid is a super common one as well. Um, <clears throat> And the last, the last two, they're because you can't have di acids, and so you can have propane dioic acid, also known as malonic acid, uh, and you can have butane dioic acid, which is also known as succinic acid. So malonic acid is something I want to introduce now because it's going to come up kind of later, that at least that the look of it, and then succinic acid is a really common uh, acidity regulator in food and beverages. So you might see that on your labels at home. Um, so the next thing is physical properties, right? So the physical properties as well as the spectroscopic properties or the spectroscopy associated with the nitriles and carboxylic acids. We know this stuff again, so this is pretty much a, a quick review. Um, but uh, the physical properties I want you to do on your own, right? So there's always the like, oh, five carbons or less or more and you get the solubility in water, right? So. Just take a look at that on your own. It's pretty straightforward. When it comes to spectroscopy, what I'm gonna do is draw this kind of weird color-coded carboxylic acid to help us um, kind of make a quick and easy reference chart to see where these different functional groups show up on proton NMR, carbon NMR, as well as IR. So for the proton NMR, <clears throat> What we have, the only acidic, well, the only protons on a carboxylic acid could be the alpha hydrogens, which show up at 2 to 2.5, coated in blue. And the OH, coated in purple, shows up at between 10 and 12 ppm. So those are super obvious, uh, especially that OH. For the carbon NMR, it could be a variety of them, but the one that's distinct for carbonyl carbon, or sorry, carboxylic acids, is that CX in green showing up at 170 to 210 ppm. The IR also has that carbonyl stretch at around 1700 inverse centimeters. And we also have the OH for carboxylic acid, which is crazy because uh, it has a range of 2500 to 3500. And this is because it's hydrogen bonding with probably another one of itself, forming a cool looking dimer. Uh, for cyano groups, we have no protons, at least associated with that functional group. But we do have a carbon at 115 to 120 ppm in the carbon NMR. And we have a nitrile group at 2250 inverse centimeters. Okay. So let's see about some practice. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. How could you distinguish between the three compounds um, using only IR. And so when we're doing this, we wanna just look for the functional groups, right? And look for the relevant functional groups, the ones that are going to actually show up in the higher um, wave numbers, because remember 1500 or below pretty much, we don't really care about that, that's the fingerprint region. So for this one on the left, we have an OH, we have a carbonyl, the second one, we only have a carbonyl, no OH. And then the last one, we have an OH, but it doesn't have a carbonyl stretch. So when we're trying to differentiate between the first two, we can see that they both have carbonyls. So uh, we were looking for that. The last one doesn't. Uh, if you do have a carbonyl stretch and let's say a giant OH peak uh, from 2500 to 3500, then you know you have the first compound. Um, if it doesn't have a giant OH peak, then it's probably the middle compound. And so we're just going to have to tally up all the functional groups that we see and then help us, that will help us decide what compound we are trying to identify. It's all about that process of elimination. Okay. So the next topic of discussion is going to be just some interesting compounds, just some stuff we want to point out that we might see in our everyday life again. Um, <clears throat> and one of them that I always, always like I loved because I found it super interesting is sodium benzoate. So sodium benzoate is actually found in sodas, right? It's like a preservative or it's, it might be in other foods and stuff. But what I found so interesting about this is that I found out also that when I was younger that this is in fireworks, like come on, like we're gonna just take a little sippy sip of some 
some root beer and then also like make some fireworks out of it. Like, how is this in my soda as well as my Piccolo Pete? That's weird to me. The, the food industry is wild. We also have this other carboxylate, something you'll learn about um, in your nomenclature studies. But this one's called potassium sorbate. And you probably recognize the name because it's all up in your food as well as a preservative. So uh, that one looks pretty cool also. Now this one, <clears throat> I, I'm not super familiar with it, but it is a drug for the, to fight breast cancer. The reason why I wanted to show you this one is because I love symmetry and molecules, especially like intricate ones that are like not just your typical like alkane or whatever. This one is called anastrozole. And like I said, it is a breast cancer drug. But just look at those cyano groups and then that cool five-membered ring with all those nitrogens in there. And it just kind of looks like a weird bug of some sort, right? Or like a scorpion or something. Love the structure of that one. It's pretty cool. Also, helps fight breast cancer. So, you know what I mean? Fuck cancer. Um, there's also this guy. This is aspirin. Definitely been taking a lot of that recently cool thing about aspirin is that um, it, it pretty much occurs naturally in the environment. So this structure right here, as you can see, is not the same, but it is very similar. So this is called salicin, and this is found in willow bark. So people used to chew on that, and then they'd be feeling good, like they don't feel the pain in their hip anymore, or, you know, um, whatever ails them at the moment. Uh, this on the right is salicylic acid which if you're in lab, you guys are super familiar with aspirin and salicylic acid and how they can go back and forth. And so salicylic acid is, so salicylic acid is actually a decomposition product of aspirin. So uh, if aspirin in the presence of acid will break down into salicylic acid. And so if you think about it, if you're taking aspirin and it gets into your stomach, that OH group is, or, the, the aspirin is going to break down into salicylic acid. And so, um, you know, I haven't done my research, I'm not gonna lie, but I would presume that salicylic acid is actually the active component rather than aspirin. So, I mean, back in the day, aspirin was actually formed because uh, salicylic acid by itself causes some uh, irritation. Um, and so they had to make a less uh, irritating form of it and that would turned out to be aspirin so there's a cool little excerpt in your book that you can check out if you want or hit that wikipedia page or something so i love reading about the origins of drugs and you know where they came from what they were originally used for uh, <clears throat> so the cool the basically the way aspirin works is that it prevents the synthesis of something called prostaglandins and prostaglandins are actually the cause of pain and inflammation. Well, yeah, get those right out of here because I'm not trying to feel inflammation. That's why I got this cough right now. So um, the way it works is, so we've got this carboxylic acid here. It's a got a couple bond, uh, double bonds in there. It's called arachidonic acid. So I was trying to tell my wife about this and well, first let me preface this by saying, yo, we're in isolation. We're just with each other all the time. We don't, it's not like I just be like, oh, hey baby, how was your day? Like I know exactly how our day was because I was there every single moment of the day, you know, like, and we know what happened with the kids, we know. So if I'm going to talk to her about something, I got to talk to her about something that she's not aware of. So, hey. I was teaching teaching the youth about arachidonic acid, and she was like, is this a joke about dinosaurs? Um, so, mm, kind of, maybe, should I make a joke about it? I don't know. I don't think I'm good enough. Let me think about it. But I thought that was hilarious because arachidonic acid sounds like a good joke. I actually, you know what? Let me make that let me make that your guys' job. Come up with a dinosaur arachidonic acid joke. And the best one, I'll give give a couple extra points, you know? Why not? It's fun.
So what I could do is probably have you guys submit those to me and then you, and then I'll like, I'll try and filter through some of them. Don't get offended if I don't think it's the best one. Cause I mean, it is what it is, right? Let's just, it's all good. It's fun and games. So, but maybe I can throw a couple at you guys, like the top three or something like that. And you guys can vote on the best one and then you get a little something, something on the side. So that's cool. Anyway, back to chemistry. Boom. So, oh, hold up. Cause <laughs> We're about to get sidetracked again. So, arachidonic acid gets converted to this crazy looking structure right here. This is an intermediate, because you can see that that oxygen-oxygen bridge, you know that's gotta just bust out, right? Like, that's not a very stable structure, so it's an intermediate. And then, boom, it just explodes. And then, you end up with the desired compound, the, the prostaglandin, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the PGF two alpha. And so this prostaglandin is, that's what causes the pain and inflammation. So I don't know, like, I'm just trying to make this fun for you guys. And I can't help but think about the Kool-Aid man when I think about this intermediate, because this oxygen oxygen bridge right here is so unstable that it does just bust out. Like, I don't know if you guys, you definitely don't remember the Kool-Aid man. Cause you guys are like born in 2000. So but the Kool-Aid man was, he just basically would bust through doors and walls. And it was a great, weird time for little children my age. So, yes, we're about to Google that stuff right now. I'm going to show you a quick video, a little sidetrack. If you want to skip this, obviously you can. I'm not, it's not like I'm wasting your time, right? If anything, I'm making it, I mean, we're in isolation. We got time. So, I Google the Kool-Aid man. And what you'll see is a compilation of videos of dude just busting through. Oh, boom. It's like, where's the Kool-Aid man? Boom. I'm speeding this up for you guys so we don't waste too much time. But when he would come through, he'd be like, oh, yeah. And that's why it was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I think, do I need to do like a trademark or copyright that I googled it on YouTube all rights reserved for YouTube or something <clears throat> anyway Kool-Aid by the way if you guys don't know about Kool-Aid it's delicious um, as Dave Chappelle would say it just requires sugar water purple it's bomb but not the healthiest thing for you let's get back to chemistry how about that okay sorry a little detour for Jess um, you know got to make this as normal as possible I would probably bring that up for you guys in class too <clears throat> so Carboxylic acids, they are Bronsted-Lowry acids, right? It's, it's in the name. And the pKa of typical carboxylic acids is, a, <coughs> is about 5. And so, let's see what the acid-base reaction looks like, right? We got a base swooping on that proton, makes a carboxylate, that charged um, species. And then this charged species actually has a resonance structure, right? So remember for acid-base reactions, uh, we have to form the weakest acid and the weakest base. So that HB, the conjugate acid, has to have a pKa that's greater than five, right? In order for this to actually work. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen. Because <clears throat> that means that the base was not strong enough to remove that acidic proton on the carboxylic acid. Now, although it is a an acid, it's still not just gonna give it up willy-nilly to anything it's got to be a strong enough base. So we have these lists of bases. Uh, kind of funny because sodium bicarbonate, ammonia, sodium carbonate, sodium methoxide, sodium hydroxide, sodium ethoxide, and sodium hydride. Some of those were actually in that soda from Mexico that I showed you guys um, from a student. And, uh, you know, that's kind of funny, right? Like, anyway, conjugate acids. PKAs listed right next to it. Notice that the PKAs of the water and the ethanol and the methanol, are, they're about 16. And so all of these guys will actually do the trick. So every single one of them is strong enough to deprotonate the carboxylic acid. That's because the conjugate acid is weaker because the PKA is higher than five. Okay. So <clears throat> again, this is acid-base chemistry. We did this a long time ago. Um, this is going to be probably a really helpful re review though. So that's why I'm gonna do it for you guys. We have ethanol, phenol, and acetic acid. 
So as we go from A, B to C, we have an increase in acidity. So we have a pKa of 16, 10, and 4.8. So those are all, as the pKa goes down, it's more acidic, right? So why is this the trend? They all have, they're all pretty much the same structure. They got OHs, and that's the acidic proton. But recall that the strength of an acid is determined by the stability of the conjugate base. So what does the conjugate base of each of these things look like, right? Well, we have the eth oxide, the phenoxide, and the acetate. And <clears throat> labeled A, B, and C, as we go from <coughs> as we go from left to right, we have an increasing in the stability of that conjugate base. That's why the acid also in the acidity increases from left to right. There are four factors to help us determine uh, the strongest acid: element effect, resonance effect, inductive effect, and hybridization. So the first this is in order of priority as well. So the first one, element effects. All of the element, or all of the compounds above A, B, and C have an acidic hydrogen on the oxygen. They have the high acidic hydrogen on the same element. So A, B, and C apply for the element effect. So we have to go into the next one, resonance, to distinguish between uh, trying to determine which one is the most acidic. B and C both have resonance structures, but C has a better resonance structure or a more stable resonance structure. So if we draw the resonance structure of the phenoxide, we can actually see that we have, at one point, a carbanion, whereas the acetic acid only has a negative charge on the oxygen. Since that negative charge is on the oxygen, it's more stable because it's a more electronegative atom. We should remember uh, how to use the inductive effect as well as hybridization to determine which compound is most acidic but we don't need to in this case. We were able to kind of apply or determine which structure was the most acidic based off of the first two alone. But we do want to talk about inductive effects. So, so let's take a look at a variety of structures and then we'll try and work our way through it to see how we can determine which is the most acidic carboxylic acid. Okay. So they're gonna, there's going to be a variety of structures uh, with different, uh, I guess, factors that would we would apply to these carboxylic acids to determine which ones are the most acidic. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the top one first. <clears throat> this particular pKa is 2.8, 4.8, as well as 5.1. Now let's take a look at why that would be the case. So these are all pretty similar structures. We have three different carboxylic acids with different things on the alpha carbon. So the alpha carbon on the right has three methyl groups. <clears throat> and then the alpha carbon in the middle just has three hydrogens. And the alpha carbon on the far left structure has one chlorine, an electronegative atom, as well as two hydrogens. So this is in fact the reason why the we have this trend for electro for acidity for these carboxylic acids so the electron donating groups they actually destabilize the conjugate base and so because they're putting more electron density into a negative thing and so that's why the acidity is 5.1 or the pk is 5.1 compared to the acetic acid <clears throat> but the Chlorine on the far left structure is an electron withdrawing atom, right? And so this is inductive effects. It's inductively withdrawing ele uh, electron density from the carboxylate conjugate base, and or uh, yeah, from the carboxylate conjugate base, and that stabilizes it because it makes it less negative, and uh, therefore this particular structure is more acidic. Now the same could be said for the next three structures. Inductive effects is, a, is going to be the cause of this particular pKa trend as well. We have one chlorine, then two, then three electronegative atoms, removing electron density. And this is what's ultimately going to make the structure on the right more acidic. <clears throat> now if we compare just electronegativity in the next compound, 
we have a chlorine versus a fluorine. That's the only difference in this structure. We have a pKa of 2.8 versus 2.6. Well, the fluorine is more acidic, the fluorine compound is more acidic because fluorine is more electronegative. And so again, all of these are using inductive effects to kind of help us understand, or to to help us determine the which compound is more acidic. If we look at the bottom three, they're all the same number of, they're pretty much just constitutional isomers. They have the same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen, the N chlorine, but if we, we see that the main difference is the location of that chlorine. That chlorine shifts from the far left and it moves a little bit closer to the right to that carboxylic acid. And that ultimately is what's decreasing that pKa. We see it goes from 4.5 to 2.9. And that's because the electron withdrawing group is getting closer to the carboxylic acid or the acidic proton. So that's gonna help stabilize, again, the conjugate base the carboxylate. <clears throat> so the next thing that we want to get into is substituted benzoic acids. So benzoic acids are the benzene with the carboxylic acid on it, right? <clears throat> and so we know that um, we have this typical acid-base reaction. So we have the carboxylic acid going to the carboxylate. And but how do the substituents affect the acidity of that car, uh, carboxyl, carboxylic acid? If we have an electron donating group, we're donating electron density into the, the ring, and that's actually going to destabilize the carboxylate. Whereas if we had an electron withdrawing group, we were removing electron density from the carboxylate, and that's stabilizing it. Therefore, it's a weaker conjugate base and also a stronger acid or the, the conjugate acid would be stronger, right? So remember, we can identify electron donating groups as NH2, OH, OR, NHCOR, that's the amide, or R groups. Electron withdrawing groups, we have a lot more of those. We have, uh, we have halides, aldehydes, ketones, carbox or esters, carboxylic acids, uh, cyano, sulfate, sulfonate, uh, nitro, and ammonium groups. So these electron donating groups are actually making benzene more reactive towards electrophilic aromatic substitution, right? So, <clears throat> i.e., or that mean, that is, that benzene is more nucleophilic, right? So if benzene is more nucleophilic, that means it's going to have more electron density or it's going to be more negative. And so this is going to be destabilizing the conjugate base of the, the, carbox, the carboxylate. So that means that electron donating groups make the carboxylic acid less acidic. Okay. Now, the next topic of discussion is going to be extractions. So extractions are pretty much using solubility differences to separate and purify organic compounds. So we did this a lot in lab. If you had lab, you know what it is. You know, you know this concept really well, but not maybe not on paper, right? Um, so let's say we have a carboxylic acid and we have a carboxylate. We know that we can utilize the acidity of this compound to actually create two very different uh, compounds. One, the carboxylic acid is it's very water insoluble, while the carboxylate is ionic, so that means it's going to be very water soluble. So we can use something called a separatory funnel. That's this fancy looking thing. We don't use this in our lab, but on larger scales, you use a separate funnel. And we know that like for example, oil and water don't mix. Well, organic solvents don't mix with water. Methylene chloride is a super common one. So in the separatory funnel, they separate into two layers. Methylene chloride is more dense, so it falls to the bottom, while water is at the top. And this will allow us to filter it out. Kind of like a, it's, got, it's got a stopcock on it, just like a burette did for the millions of titrations you guys did in general chemistry. Uh, and we can use this to separate compounds. So let's say we had benzoic acid and cyclohexanol. We know that carbox the benzoic acid has an acidic proton, much more acidic than cyclohexanol. The pKa of benzoic acid is going to be um, <clears throat> going to be let's just say around 5 while the cyclohexanol pKa of cyclohexanol is going to be more like a regular alcohol. 
So that's going to be closer to 16. That's significantly different. Remember in pH scale, it's logarithmic. So that's factors of 10 for each one, uh, each numerical value. So we can use sodium hydroxide to deprotonate or remove the acidic proton on the benzoic acid. If we just mix it, remember sodium hydroxide is going to be a water. It's an aqueous solvent, right? So essentially have aqueous sodium hydroxide, mix that with the methylene chloride as well as our mixture of benzoic acid and cyclohexanol, that benzoic acid is going to get deprotonated and form the carboxylate, which is very soluble in water. And so now it's going to be soluble in the water layer, while the cyclohexanol is still only soluble in the methylene chloride layer. So since the methylene chloride and the water layer don't stay together, they separate, we inherently separate the cyclohexanol as well as the carboxylate. And now we can separate the water and the cyclohexanol or the methylene chloride and we've separated our two compounds, pure, thus purifying the organic compound. So this is one method to purify our substances. It's pretty straightforward too. Now, not on, it's very similar to the previous example although slightly different, I want you to think about how might we separate these? So I got you the structure of cocaine, uh, as well as naphthalene and sodium chloride. So think about the physical properties of these guys and their solubilities in water and methane, in organic solvents like methylene chloride. Okay. Think about this, how you might try and do this on your own first and then, so pause the video and come back. Now remember, sodium chloride is ionic, right? That's mad soluble in water. So uh, naphthalene and cocaine, however, are probably not very soluble in water um, because they have a lot of carbons and hydrogens and or nonpolar functionalities. And so first, sodium chloride mixed with methylene chloride, as well as these three compounds, if we dissolve them all together, we will essentially separate the cocaine as well as naphthalene from the sodium chloride because naphthalene and cocaine are soluble and organic and we our organic is not mix, miscible with water. So boom, these two go to methylene chloride, sodium chloride goes to water. Now we've got these two guys. How do we separate them? Well, what we can do instead of using base is use acid, use HCl because cocaine has a basic nitrogen on it. This is actually the difference between like crack cocaine as well as uh, like powder uh, cocaine. And that's just basically you have the acid form as well as the base form. So that's also where base head comes from. That's why you use uh, a baking soda because it's a base and you can remove the acidic proton yada yada but boom it's an ionic water soluble compound and that's how you separate it after that so moving on to amino acids i'm going to abbreviate those as aa you guys probably know a lot about amino acids if you've taken cell biology the general structure of amino acids on the left and then we have the general, or sorry, the uh, with the dashes and the wedges, we've got glycine, and then we've got a generic L amino acid shown on the far right. So, one thing to note is that L amino acids are the only amino acids in our body, right? This is remember, our body is like a lock and key mechanism, so stereochemistry is really important. Another fun fact is that all amino acids are S configuration except for. Cysteine, which I thought was kind of cool because they're all S except for the one with the S or at least one of the ones with the S <clears throat> So here's the structure of cysteine. So why what is it not an S configuration? Well, we have to prioritize things and since Since our R group is actually a CH2S um, Sulfur has a higher atomic number than the oxygen that's on the carbonyl carbon so that's why that would be second priority while the carbonyl or the carboxylic acid would be priority three. Seeing how the lowest priority four is sticking out at us, we can create this little wheel structure here and we are rotating to the left. But 
I would personally use my right hand to do this and have my thumb sticking out as priority four. And then I can close it from one to two to three using my right hand. And therefore it is an R configuration. Go ahead and try this on all 20 amino acids if you want. And just to see how, um, or prove, prove that it's actually correct. So remember the only difference in any of the amino acids that occur in our body or that we consume are the change in that R group on the general amino acid structure. So, <clears throat> um, there are some amino acids that have basic portions on that R group. Um, but the general neutral ish amino acids are going to have the basic site as that nitrogen and then the acidic site for that on that carboxylic acid so this oh group is acidic and since we have a base and an acid in the same exact compound um, we have as acid base properties uh, in it within an amino acid but since they're within the same molecule we never have an uncharged uh, amino acid we can have an overall neutral, meaning a no net charge, but we always have an atom that does have a charge on it. It's never occurring as the structure is drawn above. Those are just for clarity and simplicity. Now, amino acids can take one of three different forms uh, depending on the pH of whatever medium it's in. So we have the carboxylate on the far left. We also have a what's called a Zwitter ion in the middle. That's a positive and negative charge in the same molecule. And then on the far right, we have the ammonium structure as well. So the way that the first structure is formed is only going to be in basic medium. And that's if the pH is probably about greater than 10. The middle one is when we have it in a neutral medium, and then the far right is when we have it under acid, an acidic medium. That's when the pH is probably below 2, or about the same as 2. <clears throat> Note the overall charges, the net charges of these structures. We have a minus 1, a 0, and a plus 1. So um, we will, again, always have a charge. <coughs> <coughs> have a charge on an atom and um, this is actually going to make amino acids super soluble in water and insoluble in organics. We will also have uh, two acidic protons depending on the structure. So <clears throat> that far right structure, for example, it is in an acidic medium and it has an ammonium acidic proton as well as the carboxylic acid acidic proton. And these pKa's are going to be about 2 and 9 for the carboxylic acid and ammonium, respectively. Now this actually gives us a new concept called, called isoelectric point. The isoelectric point is abbreviated PI and is the average of the pKa's of carboxylic acid and ammonium. It's a fairly straightforward concept. But what it does is allows us to determine at what pH the neutral compound will be most abundant in. And so, for example, my favorite amino acid is tryptophan. And the pKa of the carboxylic acid functionality is 2.38, while the ammonium is 9.39. <clears throat> that means that at a pH of 5.88, I will be most likely to isolate a neutral a neutral amino acid of tryptophan so i like tryptophan a lot because it has a pretty cool structure <clears throat> if i were you i would actually just take a google search of serotonin and look at the structure of serotonin and then look at the structure of tryptophan they're actually really really similar the serotonin has this five membered ring nitrogen <clears throat> and then the benzene ring coming off of it it does have an OH on that benzene ring, but if you look at the amine on the, the alpha carbon, that's actually two carbons away from that nitrogen ring. And so it, it's the same structure as on serotonin as well. So pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> nitriles, right? So we're moving on to nitriles. The synthesis of nitriles, again, is just an SN2 reaction using sodium cyanide. 
we've seen this before. Uh, just a reminder again. So on nitriles though, we have a carbon next to a ne electronegative atom. And this electronegative atom is going to create a delta positive charge on the carbon, making it more susceptible to nucleophilic attack. And um, as we saw in the previous chapter, a cyanohydrin can actually be converted to a carboxylic acid with an alpha hydroxy on it in the presence of acid or base. So here's the mechanism, it's, I was asked for it, uh, the mechanism for under acidic conditions. <clears throat> Since we have an acid, what do we want to do with it? We want to protonate something, right? And the most basic site is the nitrogen. That nitrogen is going to get protonated, making a positive charge on that nitrogen that creates a highly delta positive charge on that carbon adjacent to it making it more susceptible to nucleophilic attack the water attacks as the nucleophile and we create an oxonium intermediate with a proton transfer <clears throat> we get um, another positively charged nitrogen again makes that carbon susceptible to nucleophilic attack from water and then we get another weird tetrahedral intermediate with an oxonium, a proton transfer. creates an amine leaving group which can be kicked out by the lone pair on the oxygen. So this creates the carbonyl group that we want in a carboxylic acid. It has an, a proton on it so that oxonium can be uh, neutralized with, by the amine that just left because it's a base, right? So that removes that acidic proton and what we get is one equivalent of ammonium as well as one equivalent of carboxylic acid. So I want to remind you that this is the mechanism under an acidic medium, right? So acidic water, and notice the positive charge on the nitrogen, the oxygens, and throughout the entire mechanism. <clears throat> so when it comes to mechanisms done in acidic medium, you wanna run with positive charges always. And as you'll see in this basic mechanism, when it's under basic medium, you want to have negative charges. You don't typically want to have positive charges in a basic mechanism, in a basic medium uh, for that mechanism. <clears throat> so this cyano uh, carbon is susceptible to nucleophilic attack by that hydroxide, right? Attack there, we get a negatively charged nitrogen. This removes the proton from that water and and we've got the neutral compound here on the right. So <clears throat> now we still want that, um, that nitrogen to leave, right? So how can we get that to work? We remove that proton on the oxygen and that creates a carbon oxygen double bond and it puts a negative charge from that nitrogen carbon double bond onto the nitrogen. That, that nitrogen removes the proton from water and now we have an amide. Now, amides under highly basic conditions, as well as a lot of heat, can actually be converted to carboxylic acids. So the hydroxide attacks the carbonyl group. That goes up, comes back down, creates a carbon-oxygen double bond, and the amide, or the NH2 negative charge, leaves.
<clears throat> this is a very poor leaving group and again it is only done in drastic conditions with a lot of base a lot of hydroxide so that amide is actually going to going to remove the acidic proton on the carboxylic acid that's formed and so what you end up with is a carboxylate and an amine or ammonia and so note this is in basic medium right and so <clears throat> throughout the mechanism we can see that we formed the negative charges not positive charges and so this is going to help us identify um, valid mechanisms when we're looking at that as a question the amine is in fact a base as well and so that's going to be present in its neutral state as an amine group uh, or ammonia and we have our carboxylate and then all throughout we have negative charges as well so just keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out the mechanism or the most probable mechanism for any given reaction Okay, so now the next topic, uh, or I just kind of want to run through a couple problems for you, and then we're going to run through quite a bit of reactions um, pretty quickly, but <clears throat> it's more just for practice and uh, applications of the things we kind of already know, right? So let's say we had this structure here, and we have a series of reagents that we're going to use, sodium cyanide, lithium aluminum hydride, and water. <clears throat> so what happens when you have sodium cyanide and an alkyl halide? It's an SN2 reaction, right, to form that cyano group. So now, what does the cyano group do in the presence of lithium aluminum hydride? Remember, lithium aluminum hydride is our source of H minus. It's a nucleophile. Nucleophiles attack the carbon on a nitrile group, and that's exactly what happens. So this mechanism is a little weird, but just remember that lithium aluminum hydride is very strong and it reduces the crap out of everything, right? <clears throat> so once you add that hydride to the carbon, you get a negative charge on the nitrogen, which then forms an acid base adduct with the aluminum that's left over, ALH3. And now another hydride can come in and attack that carbon that's adjacent to that nitrogen. So it's electrophilic. And now that we've got the second one on there, we've got a negative charge on that nitrogen. We form another acid base adduct. And this acid base adduct is pretty much one step away from the final product. Remember when we have a cyano group uh, in the presence of lithium aluminum hydride, we form an amine. <coughs> and so after we add water, it pretty much just protonates everything and we lose um, this aluminum hydroxide compound as well as our desired product, the amine. Now let's take a look at this cyano group in the presence of dibol. Remember, dibol is weak sauce, you know, so it's not going to be exactly the same as lithium aluminum hydride. It does have a hydride on there, so it does attack the carbon but it stops here so this negatively charged nitrogen doesn't really get the chance to form an adduct and that carbon is not going to ever be electrophilic enough for this weak sauce dye ball to actually do its job and attack there so now in the presence of water we form an imine and this imine remember can be hydrolyzed in the presence of water as well to form the final product the aldehyde Super fun stuff. <clears throat> love the mechanisms, love the complications, and makes us think, right? If you know the mechanism, it makes it a lot easier. So I encourage you to know, know them really well. Let's take a look at a Grignard. So Grignard's a nucleophile, right? Boom, we're attacking that carbon, electrophilic carbon, with that phenyl magnesium bromide. And now we have this negatively charged intermediate. Throw water in there, we protonate that. Again, we are forming an imine intermediate, again, in the presence of water, hydrolysis, and we get our new ketone. So that R group is still there from the cyano group, but now the new thing is the phenyl magnesium, phenyl from the phenyl magnesium bromide. So just to summarize it, cyano group in the presence of lithium aluminum hydride goes to an amine in the presence of dibol 
goes to an aldehyde <clears throat> in the presence of a Grignard, so our primed magnesium bromide or magnesium halide, sorry, with water, we will form a new ketone. And then in the presence of acid or base, we form a new carboxylic acid. So we've got a lot of tools in our toolbox now, so we got to use them or we will lose them. Okay, so put them to practice. What do you know? We got practice right here. Boom. So if you want, pause it and then you can see if you get the same answer that I do. So remember for the cyano group in the presence of lithium aluminum hydride, we have this acid base adduct intermediate, right? And then hit that with water and we protonate everything. So the final product is going to be an amine. Refer to the mechanism above if you want to check that out. <coughs> so, the next example is going to be a more of a, like a multi-step synthesis. We are going to have an alkyl halide with sodium cyanide and a Grignard in water. So, remember that sodium cyanide... SN2 reaction, right? We're going to form that cyano intermediate, the nitrile. <clears throat> and then what does that do in the presence of a Grignard? Nucleophilic attack of that carbon. A couple steps later, we end up with a new ketone with that R group on the Grignard as the R group on the ketone. So let's take a look at this multi step one. If we have a Grignard with some uh, water, it's just going to quench it. Lithium aluminum hydride in the end with some more water to quench it. That uh, Grignard attacks the carbon to form a new ketone, right? What do ketones do in the presence of a lithium aluminum hydride? They get converted to alcohols. And so now we have a new way to make some fancy looking alcohols. <clears throat> and if you notice, that cyano group just grew. Uh, so if we, we could technically start from the cyclohexane would make it an alkyl halide, convert it to cyano, then you go to the ketone to the alcohol, and we just grew the or increased the number of carbon carbon bonds by a lot. And so this is this is all about this is synthetic chemistry. You guys are here. You made it. Super fun stuff now. So <clears throat> put the following in order of increasing acidity. So this is like the earlier discussions, right? So if we have a variety of benzoic acids, we basically just need to put them in order um, from strongest electron withdrawing group to a weakest electron withdrawing group, and then weakest electron donating group to strongest electron donating group. And that's what will give us our answer. So nitro groups, super electron withdrawing. Then the ketone, because it's got a carbonyl. And the next one is the bromine. And then after that is going to be the, uh, that's all the electron withdrawing groups. But then the methyl group, <clears throat> as compared to the OME group, or the O-methyl group, is the methyl is a weaker donor. And so that's going to be a little bit more acidic than the OME. So let's take a look at another example. In this example, we're going to have a variety of carboxylic acids, but we will have an electron withdrawing group or an uh, electronegative atom at different positions relative to that carboxylic acid group. So we have bromine here, far away from it, medium distance, and then closer, right? And so the electron withdrawing group being closer to the acidic proton is going to make that acidic proton more acidic. So that means we have our ranking as follows, two, three, one. One being the most acidic. And that's because of the inductive effects, right? We're stabilizing the carboxylate uh, conjugate base, and that's going to make the carboxylic acid more acidic. <clears throat> so which of the following is not part of the mechanism for the following reaction, or in other words, uh, isn't part of the mechanism for the following transformation? 
So what I want to do here is give you a reaction scheme and then it's almost like multiple choice because that's what we got to do now, right? So what you need to do is think about the mechanism for this particular reaction <clears throat> and then see which structure is in that mechanism. Uh, there's a quick and easy way to do this. So since we have acidic medium, we know that we are running with positive or neutral charges the whole time, right? So that means the two structures on the right, B and D, those have negative charges and those are not going to be present in our mechanism if it's acidic medium. This is where it's important to understand this, <clears throat> that those maybe, I'm not saying they are, but they could be possibilities for a basic medium. So a reaction of that cyano uh, group with the hydroxide. So now we're working with the two structures on the left. So you could just do the mechanism and see which one shows up, but that's going to take a long time, right? Think about what the first step is, right? So this nitrogen needs to get protonated because that's the basic site. We have acidic medium. <clears throat> and once we get that protonation, we form a positive charge on the nitrogen. That positive charge on that nitrogen ultimately results in a delta positive on that carbon and making it more susceptible to nucleophilic attack by the water. That water attacks, and then we end up with an intermediate. This intermediate here, <clears throat> excuse me, has a positive charge in that oxygen. It's an oxonium ion, right? And then in the mechanism that I gave you, we did a proton transfer just to skip, skip a couple steps, right? To get to that positive charge in that nitrogen, making the carbon more susceptible to nucleophilic attack. But what does that proton transfer actually involve? <clears throat> it revolves the removal of that proton first and foremost to make that neutral species, right? And so if we were to rotate about that carbon, carbon bond, we know that we have option uh, C as our answer. And so the reason why I did this one for you guys is, first of all, to give you an example of a type of question that we haven't really seen before, but then also for you guys to remember that a proton transfer is not, it's its actually something that's happening, right? It's not just jumping from one structure to the next. We created a shortcut to not have to draw out nine years of mechanisms, and so I rem want to remind you that that is one of the intermediates for those for that proton transfer. The next step would just be protonate that nitrogen and then we're off and running again, right? <clears throat> okay, so now that we've got that covered, a student asked me about this question. So we have, basically, we're comparing a phenol to a phenol with a sulfide uh, substituent on there. So remember that oxygen is, um, it's a congener, of sulfur, so they're, they're basically in the same row, just like phosphorus and nitrogen, and so they do the same thing, like boron and aluminum, they're trivalent, right? Sulfur and oxygen are usually divalent with two lone pairs on them. And we know that if a substituent has a lone pair, it's an electron donating group, right? And so when it comes to electron donating groups and on a ring and creating an acidic proton or not, uh, we know that electron donating groups make something less acidic, while electron withdrawing groups make something more acidic. So why is it that this sulfur-containing compound on the left is actually has a pKa of 9.53, while phenol has a pKa of 10? It's more acidic, yet it has something with a, sol uh, with a lone pair on it, in theory being an electron donating group. Well, remember that sulfur, first of all, its electronegativity is only 2.58 compared to carbons at 2.55. That's not that much of a difference. So, yeah, maybe it can donate electron density through resonance. However, it can also take on electron density through resonance as shown here. Remember, sulfur has an expanded octet. And so it can actually have... <coughs> it can have more than an octet and so this would be the justification for this particular compound being more acidic even though that sulfur has lone pairs okay so i hope that clarifies that answer 
<coughs> sorry, I'm, my my throat's breaking down. I'm dying. Um, so uh, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Um, I got uh, some homework problems that I want you guys to try out. But again, these are always suggestions. If you need something to work on a little bit extra, you can try the additional problems in there. Uh, you know, I always love those hard ones. Um, or the, there's a couple. Fun, I, I chose pretty much the ones I like. So um, take a look at those. There's not too many on the amino acids, but I know a lot of you are biology. So if you want to just uh, do a couple extra ones of those, feel free. Um, but it's all up to you. These are the ones that will should allow you to be successful on quizzes and exams. That's so that's what I'm giving you guys. <clears throat> so, and to to finish off, I gotta leave you with one. Even though we had a fun filled adventure this lecture, um, what's the most annoying pepper? Like edible pepper. It's the jalapeno, cause he's a jalapeno business. Damn, get out of here. Bye, Felicia.